For many years I've used circular saws of different shapes and sizes, mainly to cut up sheet goods like ply and MDF, but also to cut timber posts and garden sleepers and stuff like that. And I've always found them incredibly useful and I'd always recommend a DIY have one in their arsenal ready to use. But there's one type of circular saw that I've never ever owned or even used and that is the plunge saw. Because from a DIY point of view I've never been convinced that paying for a plunge saw is really worth the benefit compared to just sort of making do and getting by with a standard saw. Anyway, I've taken the plunge, so to speak, bought one, and in this video I'm going to show you how it performs relative to a standard saw, what it can do over and above a standard saw, if anything at all, and answer the main question, which is, for an average DIYer, is a plunge saw really worth it? What has a plunge saw ever done for us? Well, for me, absolutely nothing, because I've never ever used one. But there are people, those carpenter types, that really can't survive without them. But in a DIY sense, do you really, really need a plunge saw rather than just a standard circular saw? That is what we're going to find out today. You have noticed that I've actually purchased the cheapest plunge saw I could find, which is a Parkside one from Lidl. It says it has a four meter long cable, which I think is absolutely great. And at 90 degrees, a maximum cutting depth of 56 millimeters or about two and a quarter inches. And it can also tilt up to 45 degrees for mitre cuts. This has got a 1200 watt motor and a track that's 1.4 meters long, which means with what you get in the box, you can at least carry out a cross cut on a standard sheet of ply, which is 1.22 metres or four foot wide. I just paid £80 for this, which is the same price as the McAllister plunge saw from B&Q used to be. That's now gone up to £135, would you believe, which means that this one is really the cheapest one now on the market, if you can find it in Lidl's, which is exactly the same philosophy that I tell a lot of people when they ask about power tools. And I would say go for the cheap one. If you use it a lot, you can always upgrade. Better that than paying four or £500 for the super duper plunge saw, just to realise that two years later, you've never got it out of the box. Right, talking about getting it out of the box, let's get it out of the box and see what it can do. This Parkside saw is generally released every June or July, but sometimes you can still see them available in Lidl's months later. It comes with two 700mm rails which connect to each other with a bar and some Allen screws. Nice! As long as the rails are tight up against each other when the screws are tightened, then the whole rail should be straight, and it is in my case. The saw itself runs on these black plastic runners, not actually on the aluminium, which makes it quite smooth and easy to move. And it definitely comes with a decent four meter long power cable. That's a good one. At this price point, it's not surprising that the motor is a hard start brushed motor and the blade is a very average 24 tooth 165 millimeter blade, which at this point I have no intention of changing. Okay, I think I've got that. The user manual isn't particularly useful. Eight pages on why if you cut your hand off it's not their fault and two pages on how to use the saw. So let's just run through very quickly the main features of a plunge saw relative to a standard circular saw. First of all, the plunge. Plunge saws are designed, once you take off this lock with your thumb, to plunge, come out of the casing to whatever depth you want to. Now you can't lock this in any particular position. Only in this position, where you can then change the blade. There's a lever here where if you pull it, then you've actually locked it off. Now that's not there to lock it off to any particular depth. It's just for changing the blade, which means you can't lock it full depth like you can my old saw, where obviously you can change this for any depth you want. And once you do, then you've got the depth set as you want. This is always gonna plunge 
and when you release it it's always going to return to the zero position. The other thing you can do is set accurately the depth of the plunge. But there's a scale here on the front and a stop that you can put in any position and tighten up and that will stop the plunge at wherever you're going to put it. On mine there's an A and a B. The A is the depth of cut without the track and the B is the depth of cut with the track. There's five mil difference. I assume the, the track is five millimeters in depth. I don't know how accurate that is. I think we'll do a little bit of a test in a minute and see if that is accurate in any shape or form. It will cut bevels up to 45 degrees. There's a knob at the front and the back here that if you unscrew the whole saw leans over up to 45. I don't use that very often. I must admit 99.9% .9 of all my cuts are 90 degrees. So I'm more interested that when it goes back to 90, it is at true 90. And there's a couple of grub screws in here that look like you can adjust them, but they also look like they've got Loctite on them as well. So it's not one of those things you want to play with that often, just in case they get loose. The only way to check it at the moment before I do the first cut is to expose the blade and use my small square just to see what the blade is looking like. A bit difficult to tell, but it looks reasonable. Hopefully that's at 90 degrees. We'll tell it in a little bit when I start cutting some material. Now the other main thing about a plunge saw is it rides on a track and you can get track saws but they don't necessarily plunge. You can get track saws to take saws like this. So the saw is more accurate on a track, but it doesn't necessarily plunge. So the, the track is an all important part of the plunge saw. Now for many years, I've managed to get away with not buying a plunge saw because I made my own track here out of a thin piece of MDF and a piece of nice straight piece of ply that's glued and screwed to it. I've just painted it white, so I remember not to throw it in the waste bin. And that is set up for this particular saw. If I just uh, change the depth there. So I can use either side of it. And wherever this edge is, because I cut the edge off with the saw, is where it's gonna cut. So it's essentially the same principle as this aluminium one. The difference is that I've always had to make sure that it runs nice and tight up against this because if it doesn't it starts wandering off obviously you're not going to cut in a straight line after saying that this is something that i've used successfully for a long time you'll have seen it in lots of videos i've uh, done the same on the other side for this other side here cuts along here it's a bit primitive but it has worked and it's probably one of those things that you should make for yourself whenever you buy a circular saw this track is I think a lot more accurate. You can buy more extensions to screw onto this. So potentially you could then cut a full length of ply say. And it's got a couple of features. First of all, when the saw sits in the track, it has got a little bit of play, but that can be adjusted and taken up by a cam at the front and the back. This red cam here, you can see as I gradually twist it, it gradually moves out in to that slot here and it basically pushes the whole saw. So this side of the slot is always tight up against the track. Now this can be adjusted obviously, and the idea is that you put it in, you adjust both of them, you wind them up to the point where they're nice and snug against the track, but they're not too tight to stop the saw from moving. So if I just wind them up and then just back them off a little bit, strangely they've got a left hand thread. So there you go, the saw is moving in nicely across the track, but it hasn't got any play on it. So that's just about right. The second thing that the track has is this cutting edge and this rubber strip. So wherever this rubber strip goes is where you make the cut. Now, what I would say is I thought it was more rubber. This one is quite plastic, it's quite hard. It's not flexible in any way. And on purpose, this is put in so it extends past the line of the cut. And the first cut you make, you take a couple of millimetres off of that, which means that when you use this track forevermore, wherever the edge of that plastic is, you know exactly that's where the saw is going to cut. So the first thing we have to do is make a cut all the way along there. So I think the first thing I need is a board. 
So I've just put down a board to protect the workbench. When I cut through this strip, I know that I want to be cutting beyond it. If I don't put a board down, I'm going to end up cutting my workbench. And I want to cut this strip right from one end to the other accurately. That means that I can use any part of the strip in the future to line up on any mark or any line that I put down that I know will cut exactly along that line. So this is quite an accurate cut and I want it to be right all the way along. But there's a bit of a problem. And the problem is, right at the start here, if you try to cut it with the saw, the saw is hanging half on and half off. And it's all a little bit wibbly wobbly, which means if I cut now, that first section might not be absolutely accurate, but I'm relying on that forevermore to line up with a pencil mark to get an accurate cut. But if it's not accurate to start with, I'm, I'm wasting my time. So there's a trick on how to get around this, which I learned off of Peter at 10 minute workshop. And the trick is you put your saw at one end, sitting on the track, nicely adjusted. You make a cut maybe 80, 90% of the track, but because I've got two tracks here, I then disconnect them and then reconnect them at the opposite ends and complete the cut. And that means then you've got a nice accurate cut from one end all the way through to the other that I can use in the future to line up with my pencil mark and hopefully get an accurate cut. I set the depth of cut to just two millimeters, which should be just enough to cut through the splinter guard fully. With the majority of the rail cut, I separate the two halves and then reattach them on the opposite ends. This means the two short areas that I haven't cut yet are now right in the middle of the rail and are easy just to finish off. So that looks like it's worked out quite nicely. There's no lips or steps at all. That's nice and straight. So yeah, definitely that's the way to do that. Right, let's cut some timber. The dust extraction port comes with a small adapter, which I don't need because my hose seems to fit the machine nicely on its own. To gauge the accuracy of the cut using the rail to line up on a line, I draw three lines on a piece of plywood, each around one millimetre apart, and aim to cut with the side of the blade exactly along the centre line. Like any portable tool hooked up to dust collection, the hose tends to get a bit caught up, which you need to stop and sort out every now and then. So, very happy with that cut. When it comes to accuracy, that is absolutely bang on the middle of the three lines that I marked just now. So that's tenths of millimetres accuracy, which is nice to see. When it comes to dust collection, not so good. There's dust absolutely everywhere. But I think there's something that I can do to help that out. Because on here, here's a great big hole, which really doesn't help the suction in this area. So I think the first thing I need to do is block that hole up. Now you can do that with a bit of duct tape or something like that. I've got another idea. It does seem bizarre that they leave this hole that you're going to very rarely use. I mean, how often do you change a blade that actually cuts down on the dust extraction? They must know that most people are going to cover it up. Anyway, there you go. That's my version. Even with the hole covered up with my sticker, the amount of dust created that never made it into my vacuum, but all over the workbench, is quite considerable, so ho-hum. I cut through a straight piece of 3x2 on the flat to check how square the blade is to the base plate, and using the two methods that I know, I conclude that it's as close to perfect as I can see, so no adjustment required here. 
I set the depth of cut to 30 millimeters or maybe just over and then check the depth of the cut with my trusted calipers, which comes out to just a hair over what I've set, but close enough to rely on it to set the depth adjustment for standard cuts. While I was making these cuts, I thought I'd also try some quick clamps that I bought for these rails, which fits nicely in the rail underneath and holds it in place on the workbench. So I've just spent a little bit of time using the saw on different types of material like ply and MDF. And one thing I'm particularly impressed with is the way it cut this melamine. It's left a really, really clean cut, as long as the surface that you're interested in is at the bottom, so it's cutting up and through it. That is quite impressive, and I've not seen any saw do that before. It helps probably that it's got a new blade. So what do I think of the saw in general compared to a standard circular saw. Well, let's say the negatives first of all. A plunge saw is never going to be as versatile as a saw like this, especially a battery operated saw, because this is just designed to do 101 things around the house and garden. And a plunge saw is just not designed for that. You're never going to see someone with a plunge saw cutting up timber in the car park of a DIY shop to be able to get it in their car or trimming fence posts at the end of their garden with them. But what it does do is it cuts up sheet goods exceptionally well. I must say running along the edge of this cut line here worked really really well and like tenth of millimetre accuracy. I think because it's the blade is fully guarded I feel safer with it. As soon as you take it off, the blade just disappears into the garden. No one can lose a finger that way at all. The dust extraction wasn't perfect. Having said that, on my cordless DeWalt circular saw, I have no dust extraction at all on this version. So when I use this in the workshop, I do get covered in dust and definitely have to wear a mask. So by definition, it's a lot better than this one because this one just hasn't got it at all. So the answer to my original question, which was, does the average DIYer need a plunge saw? The answer is, it depends. And I say that because if you're an experienced DIYer and you're doing a lot with sheet materials and you're doing any type of cabinetry or building shelves or boxes or wardrobes or anything like that, to have a plunge saw, you'll appreciate within minutes of buying it. It's definitely a nice tool to have. And when you're working with sheet materials, I would, now I've got it, be using this compared to anything around the, the workshop. If you're a less experienced DIY and you just do a little bit at the weekends and you're doing the stuff both in the house and in the garden, then I would maybe recommend your first purchase is a standard circular saw. Uh, because this is so much more versatile, you can be using this all over the place in many different forms. This one is specialised. This is definitely aimed at sheet materials and what it does, it does really well. So what I would say is if you've got a big project coming up using sheet materials like wardrobes or shelving or whatever, invest in one of these. You'll use it for the project, you'll appreciate having it and then you'll be able to use it forever more. Now, I hope this video has helped you make your decision whether you need a circular saw or a plunge saw and I will see you next time.